size for every file's compile time and put it within the range that we know we found some already, and we extend that range a little bit, we're going to find a whole bunch of other stuff we didn't know about yet. Any other tools that that guy happened to have compiled uh, within that same week? And it might have been a completely different malware. Uh, maybe it's past the hash toolkit, maybe it's something else, but if that compile time is set, you're going to get that indicator out and you're going to be able to dig through those binaries. Now this is an out, this is interesting MAC address. Uh, don't get excited, it turns out that you're not going to be able to do this now as easy as you used to be able to, but um, everybody remembers Melissa virus, here's how they actually got it. GUIDs are actually generated on a system in, two, in multiple versions, and a V1 GUID, you'll notice it has a 1 in that position that I've indicated on the slide. Those digits at the end are the MAC address of the machine that generated it. And that's how they caught the guy that, uh, that released the Melissa virus. But version 4 is where we're at now, and you would see a 4 in that position, and the, that is actually a random number at the end, so you couldn't use that technique. But I just put this up there to just show you the possibilities with what can be represented in binary alone. Now, I spent quite a lot of time doing compiler timestamp, or compiler version checking, and runtime library version checking, and that'll be in the fingerprint tool that you see. Um, there's all kinds of information you can get there. So you know that it was all compiled off the same version of Dev Studio or the same version of Borland Delphi. Um, you can also check to see is he using static or dynamic linking of the C runtime libraries? Is he using a single threaded or multi threaded model? These things would be settings that would be in the actual Dev Studio and likely not to change unless he's you know, changing the way his projects work. Does he use standard template library? I've got a couple of guys that we're tracking who really like STL. We've got other ones that don't use it. And whether or not they use new or old versions of stream libraries. And for that reference, just check the uh, MSDN link that I put at the bottom there. So here's a little cheat chart. We'll, chart. we'll show you the different uh, versions of Visual Studio related by which Visual C runtime they're using. And I put that into a regex and I parse that in the fingerprint tool that, and that'll actually dump out. So when you run fingerprint on the binary, it'll actually tell you which one it is. Now for MFC, uh, just, just an example, this is a C-sharp regular expression and shows you how uh, you can use a regex to pull out from a file name all the requisite data you need. So do, are we dealing with the, uh, which version of MFC is it? Is it debug? Is it Unicode? Is it release mode? All these things can be derived only from that DLL name. So it's, there's a lot of data there. Now again, uh, talking about static linking, the C runtime libraries, if you see these strings, domain, tlos, sing, things like R6027, there's other versions of this, um, what you have is a statically linked C runtime. And you will, those pop out like a sore thumb. So when you see those, you know you've got static linking. You can add that to your attribution fingerprint. You can do these exact same tests with any library that could be linked statically. An example would be OpenSSL, MFC. Uh, you pick it. Um, debug symbols, there are different versions and systems for storing debug information. Depending on the settings, you will have something, one of these. Um, and what I, I mentioned this earlier, but the age field is really interesting, showing the number of times something's been compiled. Uh, so I haven't got any code in the fingerprint tool for these, but, uh, but I put the slide up to make you aware of it. There's also different types of debug information, uh, C7 compatible versus program database, I didn't continue. Depends on what the developer does. I can actually make a line level code change while I'm debugging and then hit go and not have to recompile if I'm using edit and continue. But I have to set that, and if you set that, that would be visible in the binary itself. Now, when you're looking at the strings in a binary, you're going to see a lot of stuff that looks like what you're seeing in this table right here. What that's called is name mangling. If you demangle, actually, name mangling schemes themselves are a way to fingerprint which, devel which uh, development environment is being used, because those relate to the compiler and the linker. However, uh, you can also demangle them to figure out what they do, depending on what it is. And I've got a couple examples of how you can undecorate those names. If you're dealing with Visual Studio, you can just use undecorate symbol name. And if you want to know how to do that for GNU, I put a path here to a header file that actually has the demangling system uh, totally out in open source. You can see for, for GNU, C++ demangling. Now, if you see this string, you know you're dealing with Delphi. It's always in there. Um, if you see the string, you know how this program cannot be run in DOS mode? If you don't see that, but instead you see this program must be run under Win32, you're dealing with Borland's T-Link32 linker. That means that the guy wrote it in Delphi. Um, this is very, very common. Lots and lots of malware is coming out in Delphi. I don't exactly know why it's so popular, but people really like that. Also, Google code search is your friend. Um, for example, here's a binary. I take this SSLM unassigned. I do a search on Google code search. And what I find is 78 hits are in the language of Pascal, and only two of them are in C++. I went and looked at the two C++ ones, and that's a wrapper for Delphi. 
So as it turns out, just because of the pure statistics of the results, I know that I must be dealing with a program that was written in Pascal. So you can use this approach. I really encourage you to use Google Code Search for, for a lot of this stuff. It's very, very helpful. I've actually found the source code to the very malware that I was reverse engineering once. DOS stubs, uh, there's different ones. Oh, that should say MZ, I'm sorry, not MX, but the you know, MZ50 versus MZ90. What kind of DOS stub is it gonna put there? That'll depend on what linker's being used. Um, and there's another header, I have never seen a program that has this in it, but sometimes you might see this program requires Microsoft Windows. Um, if somebody after the talk knows what kind of situation would create that, I'd like to know, I'm just curious. But I found that on the net, so I thought I'd put it up there to be sure I was complete. Okay, modern uh, things developed uh, in .NET will have embedded manifests, and manifests contain all kinds of interesting data about the uh, thing that was compiled, and they could even have um, public and private key you know, information in there, not the private key itself, of course, but the public key information that could be tied to the machine in question. Uh, but they would have to do it specifically. It's not likely a malware developer would be that dumb, but it's possible. Uh, so I wrote a nice regex here that can pull out all the different fields for you, uh, and you can see the different fields you can e extract uh, using a manifest. So as you can see, uh, using the fingerprint utility, I hope you like regex, because we leverage it a lot, because again, we're focusing a lot on string data. Now, um, developers have different tendencies to want to code in different ways. Uh, one developer might like to use NT open file or use the native API, while another one will use the C runtime libraries to deal with files. These are great. The different ways that they handle strings, for example, will be a tendency of their habit in programming, what they're used to. Uh, another one I like to look at is just the default sizes of their stack buffers that they make. Uh, another thing that kind of tips me off to their style. Uh, one guy will have a 255 byte buffer and another one will tend to make it a 256 byte buffer for the same purpose. Just the number means something to them and they just trigger off of it. So uh, we extract all of this out of the binary and use it as a part of the fingerprinting process. Compiler options that are available, optimize versus size versus speed, that'll make a difference in the binary. And there's some other ones here, fast code over small, intrinsic functions, ones that are actually embedded within it, or inline function expansion. All, all these settings that are flags in the compiler will have an effect on the binary. You can extract all that information and use it as part of the fingerprint. Also, certain kinds of changes don't require any disassembly. Uh, and a good example is stack pointer emission. When they turn that on, that some of the instructions are, that will be there are so long you can just use a binary pattern match with relatively low possibility of a false positive match. And so there's a really good example of one right there. Um, which exception handling they chose? So there's two, two in general you wanna look for. Uh, SEH is one and you'll see these strings if you have SEH, but if you're using vectored exception handling you'll have these other strings down at the bottom. And that can be used as a differentiator as well. If they enable buffer security checks, you would see these types of operations right here. So what we did is took the opcode uh, equivalent of that and added a pattern and fingerprint, and you can see the line of code there. So this is the first slide introducing a line of code that's actually from the fingerprint tool. That'll be free, open source, you can get it from the booth, and we'll also make it available for download off the website. If you see this, you have RTTI enabled. Calling conventions, each one of these will result in a different way that arguments are pushed on the stack and the way the stack is corrected after the function returns. So that's another indicator you can derive directly from the binary. And then if they're using C++, the this pointer has a tendency to be passed in the ECX register and you'll see the use of V tables. That can be detected in the binary and that would be an indicator as to perhaps what kind of uh, language they're using. Um, they're using objects. There's a lot of other ways you could tell C++ is in use because the, the name mangling would also reveal a lot of information regarding that. Um, whether or not they enable uh, UAC or not, again, these settings could be represented in the binary. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit um, and talk about the source code that the guy writes. Every program has a backbone, and by backbone what I mean is that there's a set of basic structural code upon which everything else is inserted, and that basic structural code is what you look at when I'm talking about this, this backbone. So let's look at, uh, basically here's some examples, uh, main if they parse the arguments that are passed to the function the same way in multiple different binaries, that's a pretty good fingerprint. They might have a style for parsing those arguments. Um, how do they initialize their global variables? Do they do it right at the beginning? Do they do it right in DLL main? Or is there an initialization event? Do they store them globally or do they pass them around? And then how do they initialize, do they, when do they initialize WSA startup? If they're gonna do socket communication, do they do it in DLL or do they have a tendency to do it elsewhere in a thread? So I'm gonna focus on service main. This is actually like main, but for services. What it'll do is has the responsibility of installing and uninstalling a service, 
Um, it may support run DLL32 as a mechanism for loading it. It'll have the ability to start and stop the service and, and control service. It's just a function that has to be there. So here's an example. We have DLL main. The service will be a DLL. The service main function will actually have a lot of interesting stuff you can extract. The first one is he's going to allocate local buffer space. Does he have a tendency to do it in the same size all the time? How does he do that? So that's something we can use even if he's changing the payload and its capability set, that structural code, the skeleton, would remain the same. So I've got one instance where service main has a sleep loop at the end. It's kind of dirty programming, but I've seen a lot of people do this. So that's something I can use to fingerprint an individual. And then the wait hint that's passed to the set service status call is a number. He might pick 3,000 milliseconds, 1,000 milliseconds. That's something he chose. So that's something that relates to the human on the other side. And this guy in particular I'm thinking of actually uses the hard-coded sleeps. He'll sleep 50 or sleep 1 or sleep 20. He, it's really no difference between those because all he's trying to do is hiccup the processor. But he's picking that number, and that's something we can use to track him. Multiple variants of the same stuff. So again, size of local buffer in the install service routine, and he picks a name. Service name might be the same every time. It might be a variation of the same theme. And then typically around this area, he'll need some sort of error handling or exception handling. And what you can do is look at that and see how he handles his errors. And that'll be something that relates to his coding style. And then which registry keys is he going to use to register his service? Another area you can look in is how are file names created. A lot of times log files and files on disk and in the temporary files directory will be generated programmatically as opposed to being hard coded. So we'll have some sort of small algorithm to figure that out. I've seen those get reused again and again. Um, does he use environment variables to query the path to where the Windows directory is or does he hard code that? That's another thing you could use. And does he generate random numbers effectively? Probably not. Service host. DL, or service host is DLL.exe. Here we go. So in 2005, this is my sample. I do a search on the net, and I find a post from a guy named Dargoner in 2005 that has that string in it. So this guy is actually posting source code, so he has obviously got access to it. So if we were doing link analysis, we could actually create a link between this digital identity and that what I call an artifact. The artifact relates then to the malware, and that's how you start building a map from uh, actor or digital identity to artifact to malware sample. And over time, you build that picture up and you start to see patterns emerge. So I did a search. First, I saw this source code. I, I scrolled down. I found another string in the source code, did a search, and found all these different locations in China that are serving source code or talking about source code that relates to this particular attack payload. So it's very likely we have a number of different hackers who are deriving from this basis and building different attack kits. Third-party source code. OK, this is really interesting. So grab format strings. This is the best place to look. Um, format strings are, ri are written by a human, and they're usually complex enough that they're unique and won't give you false positives. Find some in there, and then just do a Google code search, and you might get lucky. So in this particular case, um, I took several different strings used for logging, and I searched the net on Google code search, and I found the source code to a back orifice 2000. And in this binary that I got, actually literally like two months ago, he, this guy here is actually a cut and paste one or two of the functions from BO2K into his own malware and repurposed them. And Google Code Search was able to find that for me. So here's another one, PSK400. There, uh, there's a Chinese key logger called PSK400. This right here is a mutex name. You can see in the disassembly that it's being pushed on the stack to um, a call to create mutex. I do a search on the net, actually Maltigo in this case, that finds this link in China, and then I see source code. You'll notice it doesn't, in fact, call create mutex. It calls open mutex. This isn't the same source code, but it's using the same uh, mutex name. So this led me into a social space where I could start doing some additional link analysis on this target. Okay, third-party libraries. These are all the different...